Hello, I'm David Eldridge and welcome to the first of this year's live streamed writing workshops to support the Bruntwood Prize for Playwriting. Uh, it's a partnership between the Royal Exchange Theatre in Manchester and the property company Bruntwood. Uh, the prize is an opportunity for writers of any background and experience to enter unperformed plays for a prize fund totalling £40,000 and development opportunities. So we're here this evening in Bruntwood's uh, NEO um, to begin to explore some of the issues that I think are the most Im important ones for playwrights to, c to consider um, when they're at any stage of their writing career really. Um, and what I, what I thought we'd do this evening is, um, is that we'd, uh, I suppose, look at th the three areas of particular importance and significance to, to me, actually. So there are areas of um, playwriting practice that are particularly relevant to my own plays. So we're going to have a look at some extracts from some of my work as a way into it. Um, Sorry, there's no Shakespeare or Ibsen or anything <laughs> like that, but um, it's, um, it's quite good to use examples from my own work just because they're really easy for me to access and really easy for me to explain in a really clear and concise way to you and for people that are tuning in to the live stream and are catching up with it later on on YouTube, etc. Um, where I'm coming from uh, on all of this. Um, I, and I kind of really wanted us just to kick off straight away with a with a with a reading, really, which is uh, which is from my first play, Serving It Up. And um, the the scene that we're going to read is the penultimate scene of the play. And just to give you uh, and everyone else a bit of context for this um, play, basically, Sonny and Nick are best friends, they're guys in their early 20s living in East London in Hackney in the mid 90s. So the play uh, is kind of set around the time when I wrote it. And, um, and the, story, the plot of the play is, is quite a simple one really, which is that, is that Sonny and Nick are best friends. Um, but um, Nick, un unbeknownst to Sonny, is having an affair with Sonny's mum, Val. Um, and there's a bit of a kind of a complication uh, that comes uh, during the course of the play, which I think the only other thing that you need to know and everyone else needs to know before we read this aloud, where there are these girls called Teresa and Wendy that the boys hang out with a bit, and um, Sonny's got a bit of a bit of a thing for one of them, and um, and he believes that Nick kind of has been queer in his pitch a little bit. Do you know what I mean? With with Wendy. So this is kind of the penultimate scene of the play where we feel, you know, that things are b building to a bit of a, a climax. So um, what I'll do is I'll read the stage directions and, uh, and I know some of you are going to help me read uh, this, this extract and we'll just crack, crack into it and I'll, I'll say when we're going to stop and then we can have a bit of a chat about it afterwards uh, if that's okay. Are we all, all ready to go for it? Yeah? Great. All right. Brilliant. So. Um, so, Act 2, Scene 6 of Serving It Up. Uh, Sonny sits on the sofa in the flat, reading a copy of The Sun. A doorbell rings off stage. Sonny gets up and goes out to answer it. Sonny and Nick enter. Sonny sits down and picks up the paper again. I got it, Sonny. I fucking got it, didn't I? When did you start? Monday. Got to be at the depot by 6 o'clock, though. Jesus, last time I was up that early, I was tripping my tits off. Won't be doing that anymore then, now you're working. Oh no, I might not be out as much, but I'm still going to trip out. Never know, Sonny. Might be able to get some Charlie now, Mooney. You watch, we'll soon be doing lines of coke through 50 pound notes. Off in money. It's a start, Sonny. Yeah, great. Do what? I said great. You sound fucked up, what's up? Nothing. No, come on, we're mates. Are we? What's that supposed to mean? What do you think it means? I don't know. What's the matter? Look, Sonny. For fuck's sake, Sonny, tell me what's wrong. Just leave this shit out, Sonny. Tips on that. Don't fuck me, Sonny. 
What is this moody bollocks? Nothing. You ain't fucking jealous, are you? Piss off, Nick. What's... Is it then? I know you can see that. What? Tell me the truth. I don't. I'll kill you. Sonny. She reckons you haven't, but I know you've been fucking her. I couldn't help it. Oh, yeah? Val's always so nice. What? Val. Val? I. My mum? Wendy's told me. But I thought Val... No, no. Sonny sits in stunned silence. The jumper and card. From you? The jumper and card? I thought it was strange. I'm sorry. Shit, you left the pr- you still have the price tag on. Nine fucking ninety nine. Is that what she's worth? I didn't mean it. What? Leave the tag on? You've been fucking my mum, you cunt. I could kill you now, you bastard. Sonny. Don't fucking speak to me. I don't want to hear it. We're meant to be mates. I trusted you. I don't trust anyone. I trusted you. Shit, I would die for you, you cunt. I would die for you. So, Nicky boy, how long's it been going on? It's only happened twice. Only? What's the matter? Sack of shit, was she? No. You come. Sonny lunges at Nick and throttles him. They fall onto the floor and Nick gasps for breath. They struggle. Sonny slaps Nick around the face. Don't fucking cry. Fucking bollocks. Bollocks. Get off, get out. Go on, fuck off. Nick exits quickly. There's a long pause. Sonny picks up the sun and sits down on the sofa. He reads. Val enters with two bags of shopping. All right, Sonny. Put the kettle on for me, would you, love? She goes off stage into the kitchen. We hear a voice. I saw Nick on his way downstairs. He ran straight past me. You haven't been on that funny stuff, have you? Nick didn't look very well. She wanders back in. Do you want some cake, Sonny? It's a Victoria sponge. I know you like Victoria sponge. I got two in Tesco's. Special discount. Sonny? I don't know. You and your moods. She goes back into the kitchen. I know where you get your moods. It's your father's side of the family. Your uncle's just the same. I saw Nick's mum in Tesco. She said Nick got a job at the depot. She comes back in with a tray two mugs of tea and the cake cut in two. Here you are, love. I cut you a bit of cake anyway. I know you like your Victoria sponge. You all right, Sonny? Sonny? Sodge it, I'll eat it then. She eats half of the cake very quickly, punctuated by gulps of tea. Her mouth's half full. Are you sure you don't want any cake? She carries on chewing. I don't know if I can manage all this. Eyes bigger than my belly. I saw Nick's mum in Tesco. Yeah, I know. She said Nick's got a job at the rubbish tip. You didn't say anything about it, Sonny. No. You are in a funny mood. Too much of that pot makes your brains go funny. I like Nick. You should try and take after him a bit more, Sonny. <laughs> it's a wonder you haven't thought going down that rubbish tip. Whatever else, people always have rubbish to get rid of. Now there's a business that's never out of work, and I bet there are some good bits and pieces thrown out that you can pick up. You know your Aunt Vi? Well, she knew a bloke who was on the dustbins. When she was caught with him, you'll never guess what he found. A solid diamond ring. And what's all that filled the muck? A diamond ring. He had it valued. Guess how much it was worth? 2,000 quid in 1969. Didn't tell anyone he found a ring. He told them all he'd won the pools. He paid everyone in his block of flats a week's rent and treated your Aunt Vi to a weekend in Blackpool. I don't think your Aunt Vi was very grateful. I think she thought she was after sunny Spain. She starts to hum Viva España and then laughs at herself. Bloody hell, Charlie never has any of that look. And I'll tell you, Sonny, I wouldn't mind Blackpool. I'd like to see the lights. I got a new cleaning job, Sonny. You'll never guess where. Harrods? Oh, you should see it, Sonny. It's beautiful. Beautiful. And the toilets. You've never seen anything like it in your life, Sonny. Lovely tiles. I don't expect to say this about any other lab, but I would have those tiles in my kitchen. Pokey little thing that kitchen is. Can't sing a cat. Two of us who've got jobs today. Me and Nick. You see, you can get a job if you really want one, Sonny. You should do what what's-his-name said. Um, you know, Norman. Looks like a bit of a skeleton with a bald head. Anyway, you should get on your bike, go out and look. There's nothing wrong with good, honest, hard work. 
We've done it in the past and we'll do it again. Now I'll tell you what's wrong with this country, Sonny. We've become mollycoddled. The immigrants are the only people used to hard work. Now whatever you say about the Pakistanis, they know how to work. What do I get for my cleaning? 150, two quid an hour? Not much, but it gets me by. I'm not proud. I don't mind not having much. People like us have always been poor. But I know I'm honest and I've never needed to take drugs. You lot have got it made, Sonny, sitting on your backside, claiming the doll and going out thieving. Now I know you do it. I don't know how you've got the cheek sometimes. Do you know, Sonny, that pair of jeans you put in the laundry bag last week still had the labels all over it. And it was a size 42, so I know it wasn't yours. Anyway, I know you haven't the money to afford to buy them. I don't know what's the matter with you, Sonny. I did my best for you, and look how you've turned out. And the temper sometimes. It's like putting up with a bloody kid. And that mug you smashed in the week. That was my royal wedding souvenir, that was. And I only got it out because there wasn't a clean one in the kitchen to be had. You don't lift a finger. And the habits. That was my favourite mug. The only thing I had, Sonny. Your bloody father chopped the scrapbook out with the rubbish. That wedding was beautiful. Beautiful, Sonny. Charles and Di. That beautiful dress. Beautiful. Didn't I cry? Didn't I cry, Sonny? Sonny stands. Where are you going? To the pub. What for? I'm going to get arsehole. On your mood you're in. I want to see Nick. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much for reading, you two. So, so you um, just want to sort of talk a little bit about about that and why I've sort of chosen to sort of begin the workshop with that, with that extract and why it's so important to me. So, so serving it up was my first play. It was on at the at the Bush Theatre in February 1996, and um, and I and I went and saw the play a lot, um, partly just because it was fun. You know, because it went really well and it was fun to go and to, to be at the theatre and to hang out with the actors. But also, I was really keen to learn. You know, I was really keen to see what it was like again and again with different audiences and how what changed and what stayed the same and all of that. And, and one of the things that um, was, was most striking to me, I suppose, as a first-time writer, was in that, that bit of the play that we've just read. Because what, what occurred to me when I was sitting there watching it every night was that when Val comes back in, you know, so the boys have their dust up and all the rest of it, it comes out and Val comes back in. After I, the play had been on for a couple of weeks, it occurred to me that Val could have been reading the yellow pages, right? And the audience would still have been very riveted or compelled by it. Now, um, now, why, why do you think that I had that, might have had that thought, watch, watching it again and again? Because they don't, they're not interested in what she's saying, they're interested in the subtext underneath everything, that Sonny knows something that Val doesn't know that he knows, and what's going to happen, and the fact that she's just talking and talking and talking and nothing's happening is building the tension. Exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, there are things, of course, that she says, aren't there, in that part of it that, like, she talks about Nick and you, you could sort of see the actor Eddie Marsden's face. It was like every time she mentioned Nick, it was like another arrow to his heart, you know. So, of course, there were bits and things that happened in that speech that were, were kind of helping generate a bit more tension, you know. But what was really kind of, I suppose, important to me as a as a playwright really at the beginning of my career he was writing had written his first full length play and was beginning to think about the next play that I might want to write was that was that here in the play was a moment where something had happened something quite big had happened as a matter of fact you've got these two best friends who have a fight because one of them discovers discovers the other one's been having an affair with his mum, so they have a, a sort of terrible bust up, and then that creates a subtext, and then you've got this, this great big chunk, chunk of stuff that she talks about, you know, some of it is pointed, and it kind of is a kind of an arrow to Nick's heart, but really, I stand by that. She could really pretty much have been talking about anything, mm -hmm. and it still would have been very compelling for the audience. And, and I, as a kind of a young playwright, I'm thinking and thinking about this and thinking, how can I use this? And it, and it seemed to me that actually that 
if you, as a playwright, generate a subtext, then that's a place that you can do backstory or offstage action. Now, do you understand what I mean by backstory? What, what do I mean by backstory? Things that have happened prior to the story of the scene or the play? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So th things, that, things that we don't witness in the present tense of the action of the play, you know? The offstage action or the backstory, you know? And, and, and often, although, you know, in a drama we're trying to be in the present tense as much as possible, you know what I mean? Inevitably, you know, there are, there are moments in our stories that refer to the characters' pasts. Or there might be key things that have happened to do with the stories of the characters or your plot in general. I mean, you know, I've worked um, on Ibsen a little bit, twice for the Donmar Warehouse, the Wild Duck and John Gabriel Bookman, and one for the Royal Exchange, the Lady for, from the Sea. And often, a massively important part of those great middle and late period Ibsen plays are the kind of the sense that there's a real history to the to the present situation. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But we've all had that experience, haven't we, in the theatre or sometimes watching a TV show or watching a movie when uh, you feel like you're being spoon-fed a bit of information, don't you? That bit of that crass bit of exposition <laughs> where you know that the, the playwright or the screenwriter has kind of shoehorned something in for you because you need to know that. And just, just coming right back here to serving it up and me, if you can imagine me, age 22, sitting in the tiny little bush, th bush theatre above the old bush, the old pub, mm -hmm. as it was in the old days, you know, and I probably saw my own play a dozen times, you know, I'm watching it again and again. I'm beginning to think, get some ideas about how I might do things going forward. So, so I knew that drama, you know, from the drama that I'd done at university, that kind of drama was normally kind of a pattern of energy that involved an audience anticipating something. You know, we're all sitting there waiting for something to happen. Then something happens. There's an event, you know, normally something that might be a part of the plot, do you know what I mean? Something important happening. Certainly that's true of this scene of serving it up, right? The climax of the story, suddenly it's come out, the truth is out, yeah? And then there's an aftermath to that event, yeah? There's an aftermath to that event. And then in the cycle of the drama, what does that aftermath begin to turn into again? Anticipation, exactly. So you kind of have this lovely kind of rhythm in a drama of an audience wondering what's going to happen, then something happening, then there's an aftermath which kind of becomes the energy of anticipation again. And I suppose what I realised for myself when I was sitting there in the Bush Theatre, when I'm watching this again and again and again, this bit of the play, is I'm realising that if I try and do backstory you know what I mean? Or something to do with the offstage history of the show, of the characters, or that. If I try to do that, when the audience is in the energy of anticipation, then that's when it feels like shit exposition. Yeah? That's when you fe it feels like you're spoon-feeding an audience. Yeah? Because an audience is sitting there, they're trying to, you're trying to work out what's going on, right? You're kind of, you're looking for clues, you're kind of, you're sort of, you're anticipating what's going on. And you don't want, you don't want the show to dollop it on with a ladle. Do you know what I mean? Because you're enjoying working out what's going on, waiting for the, the thing to happen, aren't you? And, but, if you do that offstage action or that backstory in the energy of aftermath, when there's a subtext that's sitting underneath it, then suddenly that, it doesn't feel like exposition. It, it feels like it's integrated into the action of the play. Because we're all sitting there looking at Sonny, right, aren't we, going, this boy is going to explode. <laughs> He's just found out his mum's been having sex with his best mate. <laughs> he is going to explode. And she's talking about her day and she's talking about Nick and all the rest of it. There is very definitely a subtext that's sitting under it. 
And it was such a moment of revelation for me, you know? And I honestly, and I'm not exaggerating in any way, I've been doing this for 24 years now, um, and these 24 years later, whenever I write, I'm always thinking about this. Because the history of the characters is something that's often really important to me. I'm often, what's happened that's led to this situation that we're focusing on now and the core action of the play, there's often a big history to that. And often telling the story of that is so important to the play, right? So, so, and if you look at any of my plays or any of my screenplays or radio plays, there's often a moment like this where there's kind of some backstory or some offstage story or a moment when a character talks about the past or maybe a character, you know, is talking about history or politics, maybe, you know? I mean, those moments can be deadly for an audience if uh, an author gives a character a speech that articulates the political viewpoint of the playwright, do you know what I mean? We've all had those bad moments in the theatre, haven't we? Do you know what I mean? Ah, oh, it's the thesis of the play. <laughs> <laughs> it's the argument of the author. Well, that's fine, it's fine to do that, but give it a subtext. Having some fit, have something sitting underneath it. So this is stuff that isn't just stuff that I say to other writers in contexts like this one. This is part of my practice week in, week out. I think it's really, really important, particularly if you are a kind of playwright where the history of the world and the history of the characters and what they've got to say about the world beyond the immediate dramatic action of the play is important. So like, what I do, re what I really like to do is I'm, um, is I'm a great believer in doing and a, a, great things of, a great believer in doing things through practice is basically to test this idea. So, so what um, I'd like us all to do now uh, for maybe a bit more than five minutes um, is just to write uh, a scene uh, or a moment of drama between uh, that's one, two pages maximum because we're only going to have maybe six, seven minutes, something like that. So concentrate maybe on two or three characters. And I just want you to explore this idea in the scene. And this is, of course, something that everyone that's coming to this uh, workshop later, right, later on who's with us live now can do as well, because we'll have a short break for that when we kick off. But what I want you to do in this scene is to test this idea. So, so what I want is, there, is to try and create some kind of sense of anticipation where the audience is kind of wondering what's going on in this situation. Then have something happen. Yeah? Have something happen. And then, in the after of that, aftermath of that event, um, maybe have one of your characters talk about something that's happened earlier in the day or in the past in some way. Yeah? So would you like me to give you, uh, before we go to that task, would you like me to give you a, a further little example of that just off the bat, beyond the scene? So, for example, if Bex and I were in a scene together, sitting in silence, yeah, right, we would be creating an atmosphere of anticipation, wouldn't we? So you might write as a stage direction, Bex and David look at each other. No one says anything, they just stare at each other. Right? Mm -hmm. Then, if Bex said to me, I don't love you anymore, I'm leaving, that's the event, right? That's the thing, yeah? That's the event, yeah? Right? And then, if I start, if I start to talk about a day that we had at Morecambe Bay this time last year and what a beautiful day it was, that then there'd be a subtext sitting underneath all of that, wouldn't there, mm. of me not dealing with the fact that you've told me that you don't love me anymore and you're leaving with yeah. me. I'm talking about Morecambe Bay last year. Mm. So that's a simple example of a little scene that you could write literally in a page mm. that tests this idea. So has everyone got what I'm asking you to do, roughly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. 
Brill. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to just go to a break of about six or seven minutes to give everyone a chance to do the task and for you to do the task uh, wherever you're tuning in for. All right, well, we'll be back soon. Thank you. Hello, welcome back. I uh, hope you got on all right with that task. We've been busy with it here. Um, Jane, do you, do you fancy having a having a read of read of your one? Okay. That'd be great, and um, and then we can maybe have a little chat about it afterwards. Okay. Um, it's mother and daughter sitting in a room holding hands. Um, Mum, what I feel fine. Mum, I Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. So was there was there a kind of a was there a kind of an event in that that scene that things are, are hinging off, do you think? You want to speak to it, Jane? Um so I, I sort of set it in a probably not made it clear, but it's set in doctors' waiting room. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just seeing the specialist. And um she's been yeah. Um, so she's sort of going off in a wonderful world. Yeah. It's trying, you know, lock it out, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. And so are we, so where are we coming in on, on that? In so I, th uh, I think what I try to do is, but I feel fine. Yeah, yeah. It's this sort of, I've been given the news, but actually, no, that's, you know, yeah. you're wrong. Yeah, brilliant. So I can see that. So what, I think what would be great is, is, is if I were, to, to say, have the kind of liter literary managers meeting with you and encourage the, the second pass on the scene. Like, what, what might make, make that event just a bit clearer for, for an audience so we're really clear about the subtext that's sitting underneath it? I think it's there, mm -hmm. but if we were to kind of make it even clearer that she's, she's, not, she's not engaging with what's being said, what, what, what kind of thing might happen? Go on, you look like you were going to say something. Like I think, because I think you can get into the difficult thing and make it expositional, but there's an almost an acknowledgement that a doctor has given some news, even if it's just a, they're wrong, I feel fine. And it's a slight aside. There's an acknowledgement of an event has taken place, even if it is off stage or a bit backstage, that something has happened, you're bringing that news back into the space or not in the space. Yeah. But that acknowledgement, because I think I might have missed that moment otherwise. Yeah. Well, I mean, I just had a thought about what might make it clearer, actually, without changing any of the lines, actually, but might involve the stage direction, mm -hmm. which is for her maybe to scream, mm -hmm. they're wrong, I'm feel f I feel fine, they're wrong, mm -hmm. they're just wrong, I feel fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Suddenly, it's an event, then, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. It means something, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But gr but great, I mean, you've all just had sort of a few minutes to have a go at something, so thank you very much. No, no, no. And I can see you've responded brilliantly to the exercise. I would just make the event a bit kind of clearer, a bit bigger, maybe, so that we're really clear about what the subtext that's just sitting under what comes next. Brilliant. Bex, do you fancy having a read? Yeah. Um, okay. uh, Jane sits facing Dan. She places the pregnancy test on the table between them, face down. Dan, is that Jane? Yes. 
Dan, do you want Jane? No. Dan, can I? Jane, I mean, I've literally pissed on it, but if you want. <laughs> Dan doesn't pick it up. Instead, he sits back in a chair. Jane, okay. Dan, Jane. Jane, when I was younger, like not that much younger, but say when I was in my 20s, I used to look at people pushing prams and think, you're selfish. This whole world is falling down around us, like burning up and melting, and there's you procreating like there's all the space in the world. And then one day I saw this woman. She had a baby that looked like a tiny version of her, like an actual mini me. And I watched her in this cafe just feeding her and laughing. She's laughing, the baby's laughing like a mirror. And I thought, how mad that must be. Fantastic, brilliant, very good. So in that one, so what was the bit of the scene that was in the energy of anticipation? The test. Like one to two of the pregnancy test. So what, the watching of the test, and what was the event? What was the kind of hinge of the scene, the main kind of event? Well, it's him turning it over, isn't it? It's him acknowledging what the results yeah. are. Yeah. 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 And then what, what's the story that's told in the aftermath of out of that event? I know we've just heard it, but for the, for the sake Maybe of the experience. changed his perspective, like he didn't really think about having kids and didn't want to be a parent or whatever, but now he's like changed his mind. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. And it's a, it's a kind of a kind of a, a kind of a model response to the exercise in a way. How did you find? How did you all find doing it before we, we move on to the next bit of the workshop? Go on. It was. It, it's hard to do it so quickly when you're thinking about subtext and events. Yeah. You, you sort of want time to put those in place, but actually, as a way of constructing a scene, yeah. it's a really nice model for just going, mm -hmm. okay, anticipation, event, aftermath. Is a really nice way to just really quickly shape something. Yeah, well, of course, if we're, if we're writing, working on a scene like this, this is, might be something that you might sweat blood over over a number of weeks, right? Do you know what I mean? And a number of iterations and drafts. So, of course, let's all take that as a given. Do you know what I mean? But for, as a way of exploring the idea now, do you know what I mean? Do you, do you feel clear about how that event? That event itself creates the subtext, doesn't it? That that can sit underneath this soft stage action or that backstory. Comes after that is automatically then more interesting. Yeah. yeah. Because you go, um, how are they going? Why are they not reacting to that in that way? Or what's going on? What? Are you? Yeah. Well, in a way, that was a bit the example I gave just before we went to the task between us, wasn't it? Which mm. was which was my character wasn't was just not referring to the fact that I was just being dumped, was I? Yeah. You know? So that was completely kind of sitting under it. Looks, you look like you're about to say something no, there. No, no, I, just, I find it really, I think it's a really interesting way of, like, I think you can get away with more as well. You can get away with stuff that feels a bit more like you wouldn't normally, like if they were having that conversation, you wouldn't necessarily say all that stuff and you'd, it'd feel a bit clunky, but actually, when you do it like that, it feels like you can get away with yeah. more stuff and it feels, like, more real and, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a thing as well, like, I mean, I think it's quite good, there's nothing wrong as playwrights thinking about the crafty nature of what we do in this way. Like, I love, um, comes from Alan, Alan Akebourne, I think, the, the crafty art of, my, of playmaking or something, his book is called, you know, the craftiness of it. I know Martin McDonough has a thing of, of always hiding a plot point with a joke, because kind of the audience is, look, yeah. is kind of... If the audience is too busy laughing to think about this kaplunk of the plot point that's just yeah. gone in, you know? Yeah. So it, it, I, I sort of think that's quite good what you're talking about, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's the kind of, it's the bit of what we do that's, that's the skill. With the, with the event, it, it, because afterwards is so uh, dramatically charged, I don't think it's that, it's not as a, I don't think getting away with stuff, mm. it's the fact that everything then does have like a very, yeah, everything has a dramatic action, that everything acts on each other. Where they, like you said, it could be the other pages, but that she's doing something to him. Yeah. Um, but because everything now becomes, everything has dramatic connotations. That's because right. Because you've created such a charged yeah. environment. That's right. And I think it's absolutely right because you're constructing something that's, that's inherently dramatic, aren't you? Rather than writing conversation. You know, and, and that's certainly, you know, certainly when. Um, you know, all of you have all, like, 
done much more than this, do you know what I mean? You're already, all of you, come into the attention of various theatres and have been talent spotted and all the rest of it. So sort of, just, just you know, not referring to you, but sort of thinking maybe about writers who are, who are just beginning to have a go. Often a thing that I come across quite often is, is the writing of kind of conversation, get, just getting characters talking, but not necessarily having anything at stake. And I think that's a bit what you're talking about, isn't it? Is that it's a way as well of ensuring that there's a dramatic imperative if something's happening. I think it's really difficult, and I personally, to, to, to write, for me to write in this way, to actually get to the point straight away. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of time spent crafting this scene and trying to build up really nicely to this point, thinking yeah. that you've done your audience a service by doing this. But actually, by doing this, this is much more interesting for an audience. But... I know it sounds a bit odd, but it, it, I feel really, um, I haven't, it's getting the confidence to actually yeah. go in at this point. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's something, it takes a long time to, to be comfortable with yourself and, and uh, be confident, I think, in your own work to get to that point. So I think this is a great exercise. Yeah, well, I, d I, c I completely agree that confidence is really important for all writers to try and have the, have the confidence to begin in. And that's something that never goes away. But I would... I would say also I think that there's something that you can slightly you can slightly force yourself to do it in the way that you can construct your stories as well so think about beginning a story rather than beginning a scene and getting characters talking to get to a point and that's actually something I'm going to come to in the last part of this workshop so actually going to address that quite quite head on actually yeah. <laughs> so just sort of moving on slightly now for this next part of the kind of workshop we've not got um a reading as a way of leading us into this but i just want to sort of talk a, a little bit and then we'll set up another task or exercise for everyone to do again in the same manner of testing an idea over about five minutes um, when I, again, it kind of goes back to kind of when I first started writing in particular, but, but has carried on through my whole writing life, particularly with the writing of a first draft. I think this is important to what we I want to talk about next. And that's the issue of writing on the nose. Um, do you know what I mean by writing on the nose? Yeah. So... So maybe a quick explainer for anyone who's tuning in who maybe is not so sure what that means. What's, what's writing on the nose? So kind of that idea of writing everything that you're seeing in front of you and being able to go, oh, hello, you are doing this. Yes, I am. It's that really two-dimensional way of portraying a person yeah. rather than going people are really complex and don't always say what they actually mean or want to say. That's right. So characters saying what they're doing, mm. that's exactly right. It's a brilliant definition, you know. And I think it's really common for a first draft, actually, because often in a first draft, however much planning you've done in advance, and we, we vary, don't we, as writers? Some of us like doing a lot of planning. Some of us like doing a little bit. Some of us like to just get into the blank page and see what happens. We're all different, but whatever degrees of of planning you do, I think, as a, as, a, as, a, as a playwright, there can be a tendency on that first draft where you're kind of finding it as you're going along. You're kind of explaining it to yourself as much as your embryonic audience, do you know what I mean, what it is that's going on. And we can often fall into the habit of writing on the nose, do you know what I mean, mm -hmm. just through virtue of that initial exploration and I think it's something really important that as you go through a reading redrafting process that you gradually eliminate and stomp on do you know what I mean because apart from anything else it's not much fun for an audience is there what's what anticipation is there for an audience what creativity is there for an audience in a in watching a transaction where everything's kind of laid out for you and explained for you by the characters right so it's really important, but also, I, again, I have a, have, a, have a way in that I try to find that really helps with this, which is to do with the relationship between the physical action and the spoken language in a scene, in a moment of drama. So I remember, um, you know, I remember uh, in those first years of writing, I remember reading David Hare, I think, uh, one of his essays on uh, playwriting, and I can't remember what, much what the essay was about, but I remember David Hare said in it that, 
you know, he was, he was quite sort of narked that the novelist Martin Amis um, had said somewhere or other, he'd made a remark that, that writing plays must be easy because it's only writing dialogue. And, uh, and I remember sort of, I sort of felt outraged at second hand <laughs> just reading this as well, you know, and kind of quite understood David Hare's anger. And also I sort of realised that it, it wasn't just that it was quite patronising, it also seemed to me to be kind of fundamental misunderstanding of what it is to write a play, to write a drama, you know? Um, because surely what we do as playwrights is we create a script that's a template for dramatic action, for a drama, yeah? Uh, and in dramatic action, it's, you know, what's going on between the characters moment by moment, what they're doing to each other that's moving the story forward. We're going to touch on that with your lovely comment just before about what's at stake and something you know, there being a dramatic imperative where the characters are trying to do things and want things. Um, but often, you know, although we might have thought about that as dramatists when we're beginning, I think often we're also, maybe we're in that first draft fog where we're trying to get the characters talking and we're trying to work out what's going on and you maybe some of the time know you've got something at stake because you know you've got a character that one thinks other things haven't. So often what I give myself, and I often think of, Martin fucking Amos when I, when I do this kind of work, but it's kind of important, is, is I try to think about the fact that there, there's the kind of subject of kind of um, the dialogue between the characters, what the characters are literally talking about, and then I try and find something um, that's really different that the characters are doing, if I can, for the scene, you know? Um, because immediately then, all that you're sort of giving, you're sort of, you're setting yourself up in the scene to, to sort of almost quite self-consciously construct the scene in a way that's not, it can't be on the nose. Do you know what I mean? So in a play of mine, for example, Under the Blue Sky, what, what goes on in the discussion of the scene, if you like, is that Nick is kind of trying to dump Helen but before he dumps her, he's sort of seeing if he can get one final shag in while they're pissed. Yeah, that's kind of the, the subject of the discussion. But kind of the action of the scene is this is, this is, he cooks a chili con carne. And that's what happens all the way through the scene. So it's a really good, it was a really good way of me ensuring that something else is always going on. It also gave Nick, the character of Nick, a place to hide. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. When, when things are getting a bit tough with Helen, he can always start to sort of open cans of kidney beans and give, give the chilli a stir, start thinking about putting the rice on. You know, so it's, it's almost giving yourself something as a writer that's immediately trying to take the curse off any kind of, any looming on the noseness. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, even before you're thinking about what the dramatic action is in a really pointed way, like what the characters might really want from the scene as an objective, just giving them a different physical action is a really great starting point to help yourselves out as, as playwrights. I, I um, really love, there's a Pulitzer winning uh, playwright called Paula Vogel, really wonderful playwright, not so well known unfortunately now as maybe she was 15, 20 years ago, wrote wonderful plays like How I Learned to Drive and uh, The Baltimore Waltz is another wonderful play of hers and um, Paula Vogel is also a fantastic teacher of playwriting I think that she took teaches at Brown University in the States, actually. And one of the things that Paula says is that the only place in a play script where the intentions of the author should be absolutely clear are in the stage directions, which I really, really love. That's something I always think about as well when I'm writing. Do you know what I mean? That, that, you know, that in terms of what the characters are saying to one another, and what they're doing to one another with language, that there's a space for the audience to wonder what's going on. But actually, as a playwright, you can be very, very precise in the stage directions.
So I want to set up another task, and we'll maybe maybe take five minutes over over this one. And this one is a real opportunity to have a bit of fun. It's like the point, whole point of this exercise is to try and in really in, enjoy it and to to enjoy um, in the kind of incongruity of what's being set up. So what I want you to do is again to write a scene that's that's a page, certainly no more than two pages. We're only going to do this for five minutes. And what I want you to do is I just want again you to test this idea. So it's it's not writing on the way that not writing on the nose, the way that you're going to ensure that you're not writing on the nose is that the characters in the scene and I'd maybe concentrate on just two characters, yeah, are going to be doing something in the stage directions that they're not kind of doing in the spoken language. Do you know what I mean? Yeah? Yeah. So uh, I love doing this exercise and it's fun. You know, it's a fun thing to do and I sometimes get people to do it in workshops on their feet. We're going to do this, we're going to do, we're going to write it down in this workshop, aren't we? But. But over the years, for example, I remember doing this exercise with some Welsh playwrights years and years ago. And I remember some writers coming up with a scene where we had two surgeons doing a heart transplant. And all through the heart transplant, they were talking about the opera. They were having an argument about opera. OK? So you've got lots of stage directions, which are the kind of tense open heart surgery. And on the kind of top line, you've got the dialogue that's about opera, yeah? And then another time, more recently, I did some work with some students at Manchester Uni down on Oxford Road. And these two girls did an improvisation where the two women were, women were knitting, yeah? Uh, and so that was the physical action of the scene. That's what the stage directions were interested in. But the language, the top line of the scene, was about a big big drugs deal yeah it was all about weed and selling weed and that all that stuff going down so enjoy the exercise enjoy the incongruity yeah is what I'd encourage you and anyone at, at home that's uh, gonna do this task now or later on really enjoy the incongruity of it does everyone understand what I'm asking you to do Fantastic. All right, well, let's crack on. And what we'll do is we will again take a break of about five minutes just while everyone does this task. And then we'll come back in together and share some of the work and talk about it. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so, Amy, do you fancy having a read of your, your yes. scene, please? Thank you. Okay. A and B are constructing some IKEA flat pack furniture. A has the instructions. A. It says we need F3. B. I'm really sorry. A. I don't want to talk about it. B holds up part F3. A takes it and fits it in. B. I get that, but I just need A. If we talk about it, I'll cry. B. Right. A. E12. B. The thing is, what's E12? A. I don't know. Holds up the directions. <laughs> Looks like the squiggly thing. B. I feel really bad. A. Well, you should. B. I'll buy you a new one. A. Are you fucking kidding? B. No, I'm sorry. I mean, when you're ready, A finds part E12 and fits it. B picks up the instructions to read the next step. A snatches the instructions off B and reads them. B. Had you... I heard you had it a long time. A. Nine years. B. Fuck. A. We're missing that part? B. I'm just, I'm, fuck. I just didn't see it. It ran out so fucking fast. A starts hammering and trying to force in a piece that doesn't fit. B. I only saw the tail and then, A. 
Will you shut up and help me? Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I think that's, that one worked really well, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so first of all, so what's the, what's the physical action that Amy's written in it? What are the characters like doing? So what's she written in the stage directions? The train on the, the kind of train to build the IKEA set. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. And what's the what's the sort of the subject of the <laughs> increasingly fraught dialogue between the characters? Uh, so you gave that a little gasp then, didn't you, Bex? <laughs> I thought it was going to be that they'd broken their phone, like, or something off theirs, and then, <laughs> then when it was, I thought it was like, oh, they'd just broken something, and I was like, oh, that's a bit. But then, like, when, when you were like, it's got a tail. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? Like a dog or it a might puppy or cat. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was what I thought. Over. So there's sort of in, inadvertent running over of a cat? Yeah. yeah. That kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. But, I mean... Can you, can you just kind of see the promise in this exercise, yeah. you know, like, because um, also as well, I mean, what's interesting is although I said to you all not, said to you not to worry too much about, like, where the drama comes from, it just enjoy the incongruity of the physical action that you're attending to in the stage directions, and then, you know, what, what's going on between the characters in the language, you know, in the conversation or the talk or the, the spoken language, you know, you, you know, you, you kind of, um, your instincts as dramatists can't help but kind of rear, rear its head a little, do you know what I mean, as well? So, do you, do you understand what I mean? I think it's often quite a good thing when you're kind of working on a scene to just think, well, what's the, what's the physical action and what's, what's going on in the dialogue? You know, and that's going to kind of keep me straight a bit, do you yeah. know what I mean? You know, it's going to keep me honest and it's going to... Kind of, it's going to help ward off the kind of on the nose dialogue a bit, you know. Yeah. I really love the bit where you said about one of the characters hammering in the piece that doesn't fit, <laughs> and that just said, and um, you know, you often sort of sound fine. Yeah, but yeah. The action obviously <laughs> tells you something. And yeah, but they're not. Did now, but I just, I've just got that in my head. Of, you know, somebody trying like making a racket or getting really angry with this piece of furniture. So <laughs> I thought that was visually that was, that was wonderful to watch. Yeah, I mean, I think probably there are touches many chords, the sl slightly sort of fraught put assembly of IKEA flat pack <laughs> furniture is something that quite a few people probably uh, recognise. That was great, thank you, thank you. Do you fancy having a read, yeah. read as well? Yeah. Um, Michael, sits out, out, Michael sits outside a shopping room changing rooms on a stool. Peter is inside, unseen, getting changed. Michael, he's a knob. Peter, yeah. Michael, a lying, cheating, cock rotting cunt. Peter, <laughs> don't get so stressed. A shirt flies over the curtain. No good, get me a medium. Peter heads over, picks up a medium off the shelf. Michael, stressed, I'm fucking Zen, mate. Peter, Zen people don't say fuck. Michael, you'd think he'd have been tested. Michael passes out a pair of chinos. Again, don't fit. Michael, maybe he did and just, don't know, failed. Peter, he gave me crabs, of course he failed. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, fuck. Peter, exactly. Michael, no, as in, fuck, I'm stuck in these jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's, again, a fantastic response to the exercise. Well done. So, again, just to kind of briefly analyse it, so what's the, what's the physical action in that scene? What's, what's being written in the stage, the stage directions? Fantastic. And what's the subject of the, the spoken language or dialogue that's transacted between the characters? Someone's like an STD <laughs> test, isn't it? Yeah. So he, there's one character that's very upset because he's got an STD? Crabs. Yes, <laughs> specific, crabs specifically. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Excellent, yeah. So again, really, really brilliant. You can sort of see lots of potential. I'd like to see both of those plays, you know? Really, really interesting how... Um, you know, it's not just kind of keeping you on the straight and narrow, as dramatists, as I was saying, but it's also just out of that tension that's generated from the incongruity between the physical action and the spoken language in a scene, interesting things emerge, right?
So just kind of wheeling back round to sort of my example in, in, um, of Under the Blue Sky, you know, such a kind of tense situation with this woman, Helen, who's mad about this guy, Nick. You know, and he's trying to kind of weasel his way out of the situation. But, you know, you sort of know he's slightly trying to keep the door half open, at least for that evening. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of tense and intense, and everyone kind of goes, oh, like that. But, you know, the audience absolutely loved it whenever he basically went back to the chili. Because there'd been some, <laughs> some awful conversation about their relationship. And then, you know, it's sort of say something about, you know, the chili powder. And you know, so the audience is suddenly falling about laughing. So the potential in it is fan fantastic. How did you as a group get on with the, the exercise anyway? What, what were your thoughts or did it make you think of anything? Or I think I went on a really serious, um, a serious take Go on, on it. T t tell me a bit more. Um, so my character's like setting up like a little girl's birthday party. But um, one of the character's sons has basically been accused of like child pornography. Wow. And one of the characters has basically trying to like bin off the friendship and kind of cool off the friendship. Whereas the friend's like really happy to like be helping out and um, trying to kind of keep that friendship going. But that, I think that that's fine. I mean, because, you know, I mean, I think that seeds of plays are not going to all have the same tone, are they? I mean, I think the thing is, is that, of course, there's often fun to be had out of this incongruity, mm. you know, uh, out of this kind of space that you're creating for an audience to enjoy something in. Um, but I think actually the important thing is, is that you're creating that kind of gap, do you know what I mean? Mm. So that an audience is having a complex experience as they're watching the drama moment by moment, right? Mm. And if there's a serious tenor to the scene, then that's fine. What, what you've described sounds enthralling, actually, <laughs> you know, so it's just maybe got more of a, a serious... Of them chocolate <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, of course. I think that's great, it's giving the audience another level of something to interpret and yeah. trying to figure out what's going on and what the relationship is. It's another way to, to read it all and think, oh, what's, what does that mean? Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. I think kind of quite a lot of the theme, isn't it, that we've been talking about is about in a way, treating an audience with respect, isn't it? Yeah. As adults, as your equal. Do you know what I mean? I think that's always a good way to think of it, if your audience is either your equal or much smarter than you, actually, you know? But, but you certainly don't patronise an audience, you know? And you certainly don't have to explain things for an audience. What you're doing is creating a drama and making an audience hopefully sit forward and wonder you know, giving an audience a creative experience where they're piecing things together. I mean, that's one of the things about story that we enjoy, right? Is figuring it out. <gasps> one, of my, one of my favorite moments, right, in my, in my career is when um, I said earlier that we did, um, that I did a, a version of Ibsen's John, uh, The Wild Duck for the Donmar Warehouse. And um, there was a, there, when the play had opened, all of my family came to see it and uh, like none of them are theatre people, all sort of normal people from Romford in Essex. And, um, and sort of most of, sort of them were sort of it sitting on the row behind where I was sitting. <laughs> and just, just before, uh, as the lights are coming down for the audience, for the interval, I heard my sister whisper to my mum, He's the father, isn't he? <laughs> like, 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 like. <laughs> and it, it kind of was great because in a way, that's what it's all about. You're kind of saying to an, getting an audience to go, oh, you know what I mean? And having the joy of that discovery in the story, that, that pleasure, yeah. fantastic. So like, I sort of, sort of thought what, what I'd do is just talk for a little bit more, talk a little bit more uh, for a bit, if that's okay with you. And thanks again for that fantastic response to that task. Um, just to talk a little bit more and um, and then to sort of to, to look at uh, uh, th three sort of shorter extracts than the one from serving it up together, uh, which will lead into the final sort of task of, of, the, of the workshop. And just to sort of touch directly on something that we, we were talking about on earlier about drama coming from something being at stake for the characters, you know? Um, and I, I'm really unap unapologetic, you know what I mean? Like, I enjoy all kinds of theatre, but what I really like to write is drama. 
And I think drama and dramatic action implies that there's something at stake in some way for the audience. Do you know what I mean? You know? And maybe that's just my taste and what I enjoy, but that's, that's really what I'm interest, interested in. And, um, and it was interesting in that last exercise, I, you know, I, as I was saying before, that I wasn't too bothered for that exercise if you didn't think about where the drama came from. I just wanted you to explore the incongruity between the spoken language and the physical language. But of course, you know, really, in any, in any scene, you want there to be something at stake, you know? And I just wanted to sort of drill, drill down into that a bit. What, what does it mean, this idea of dramatic action, you know, where something's at stake? And I sort of, a few years ago, came across this, um, this kind of quotation from this, this story guru that I just wanted to share with you and everyone that I think is really good. I've got no idea who this, this woman is, this woman called Martha Alderson. She's just a story guru that's based in America. But I really, I really like this quote, and I think it articulates things really, really well. And she says, what is dramatic action? Um, running is action. It's just not dramatic action. Dramatic action means there's plenty of conflict, tension, suspense, uncertainty, fear in the scene. All of this equals, in other words, drama. Without drama, your protagonist running is simply movement. Without the sense of the unknown, action is simply movement. Without great doubt about the character's ability to succeed, i.e. will she or won't she, action is simply movement. Without something or someone other than the protagonist in control of the action, action is simply movement. So what we've got here is movement versus dramatic action. Movement does qualify as dramatic action, but movement without conflict, tension, suspense is passive action with no drama. So I think that's something that I think about a lot. And what I think about is how do I, how do I ensure that there's something at stake? You know, how do I ensure that the scenes are dramatic, that I can compel an audience via drama? Um, I, I often turn to something that David Mamet says. Now, I know um, David Mamet has become a more controversial figure, shall we say, certainly in recent years um, for various reasons. But I do think a lot of his earlier writing and public thinking about dramaturgy is really compelling. And I don't know if any of you know this, but um, in um, 2005, uh, David Mamet was kind of showrunner for this drama called The Unit, um, which I think was a drama that was being made for CBS. And, um, and he sent this memo to the writing team of The Unit, all the other writers on it, because they were having a lot of trouble with the execs, uh, who he called the penguins, the people in suits, <laughs> who wanted the writers to give the audience information. Uh, but he was really annoyed by this because he thought that what their job was was not to spoon feed an audience with information. Their job was to was to tell a story and create drama, you know. And um, they, honestly, look it out. The memo to the writers of the unit. I'd encourage everyone to look it out. It's such a fantastic document. It's like a kind of an email rant, really, but it's full of pearls for dramatists. And I just kind of picked out this one where Mamet turns his attention to this question. What question, what is drama? Drama, again, is the quest of the hero to overcome those things which prevent him from achieving a specific acute goal. So we, the writers, must ask ourselves of every scene these three questions. Who wants what? What happens if he doesn't get it? Why now? The answers to these questions are litmus paper. Apply them, and their answer will tell you if the scene is dramatic or not. So again, you know, it's kind of, you know, these things, you know, like I suppose that I'm talking to you about through this evening, they're all like things that are like trying to, uh, that are kind of keeping me honest, 
Do you know what I mean? You know, I'm working away, you know, uh, you know, and even after all these years, I still can find myself bumbling through a day. Do you know what I mean? As a writer, you're trying to find your way through a scene and maybe you've planned something in abstract, but then the reality of getting the characters talking, it doesn't kind of work, doing, you know, I'm bumbling along like everyone else in my own way, you know? And there are these things that I draw upon to try and keep myself kind of straight, keep myself on the straight and narrow, kind of keeping myself honest as a dramatist, you know, what's at stake, where's the drama going to come from, how am I going to avoid writing on the nose, if I've got backstory to do, I've got to ensure that there's a subtext, these are all things that are, that are helping me, you know. Um, but I think, you know, it's really important as, as dramatists not to just be thinking about that as you go along, do you know what I mean? But it's also about kind of setting that up right from the beginning. And I know this was something that we touched on earlier, Jane, which is how do you, how do you, how do you as a pl playwright, you know, kind of almost kind of avoid the syndrome of kind of writing your way into something? Do you know what I mean? It's a very common thing. I think particularly for first draft, I certainly am doing this all the time, you know. Uh, I've, I've been doing this for 24 years, writing my ways into things, and I'm sure I'll be doing it in another 24 years. You know, we all, we all have that first draft thing. But I do think that there are some things that you can do as a dramatist in the way that you set up a story, basically, that really kind of help with this and help the, the idea that right from the beginning the stakes are really high, basically, you know, that, and that there is something big at stake. So just in the way that you conceive of something, you're saying to yourself as a playwright, right from the top, there's something big going on here. So what I kind of wanted to, what I wanted to do was in, instead of kind of explaining that further, was, was to, to read uh, the beginnings of th three of my plays. So, and literally, like, not as long as the serving it up extract, um, just like a page, a couple of pages of each. And then we'll just talk in a, into this, a, this idea a little bit about what you're setting up at the beginning of a play to ensure that there's something at stake and that from the very beginning of a play, there is a drama in play. Do you know what I mean? That we absolutely are in a world where it's dramatic action rather than just action or discussion because something's at stake. So, so first of all, um, I just wanted to look literally at the first page of a play of mine called The Knot of the Heart. And I know Bex and Jane, you were going to help read, and I'll, I'll read the stage directions here. So I'll, um, I'll kick us off and you just jump in with your dialogue in your own time. So scene one, Lucy, 27, and her mother, Barbara, 60, are in the garden of their large Islington home. It's a quiet, warm summer's evening. Barbara drinks from a glass of red wine. Lucy takes an empty Bic biro from her cardigan pocket and a folded square of tin foil. She unfolds it, tears some off and wraps it around the biro to make a tube which she hangs out of her mouth like a cigarette. She replaces the biro, tears some more foil to make a flat oblong surface and then takes a small lump of heroin out of a small wrap which she puts on that foil. Will you hold it for me? I know what that is. Lucy looks at her mother. You've never minded me smoking joints in the garden. This is too much, Lucy. Mummy, I'm 27. I make my own choices, I do my own thing. Fine, when Zap comes down, we'll go into Gibson Square. For fuck's sake, doesn't matter anymore, anymore anyway. No, don't. Please, darling. She thinks and then approaches Lucy. Lucy passes the foil with the heroin to her mother, which she holds. Lucy finds a zippo in her pocket, which she also passes to her mother. Barbara ignites the zippo, which she holds underneath the smack. Lucy smokes it. Barbara watches her daughter. Lucy backs away and takes the, t the foil tube from her mouth. See, I'm still here. Lots of my friends do it. 
Like no one's injecting or anything. It's only a tiny bit of opium. And I've had such an awful day, you wouldn't believe it. Lucy, you promised me you would never. Thank you. Thanks very much. What we'll do is we'll just go straight on to the next act and the next extract, and then we'll, we'll talk about them, if that's OK. So next off, we've just got the first um, page and a bit of a play of mine called In Basildon. And I know that um, Bex, Naomi, Josh and Connor were going to help read here. So same again, I'll read the stage directions. So Act 1, late November 2010. A large living room in a semi-detached house in Basildon. The dining table has been pushed against one wall. The sofa against another wall. So there is room for a bed in the room. Len, 60, is in the bed. He is close to death. With him is his sister Doreen, 55, and her son Barry, 37. Also there is Ken, 75. They all look at Len. They can't take their eyes off of him. Maureen, Len's other sister, 50, enters. Hello, Maureen. Hello, Doreen. She looks past Doreen and goes to Len. Lenny? Len? It's Maureen. I'm here, Len. He can't hear you, Maureen. You're too late. He can hear me. Can't you, Len? You can hear me. You should have been here days ago. Len? Tears prick her eyes and she blinks and wipes them away. Thanks for coming, Maureen. More. Maureen completely ignores her sister. Will you tell your mother I've had nothing to say to her for nigh on 20 years and I'm here for Len? I'm not here for her. Tell your mother, Barry. I wish it was her. That's all I feel towards her. More. Don't more me, Barry. I don't know how been next. She's always been the same. Well, let's not have a scene more. Not tonight. There's not much time, darling. OK, and then let's just stop that there. Actually, we didn't need Ken in that, did we, in the end? <laughs> I just realised. Thank, thank you. And then last of all, um, we're just going to look at the beginning of my play, Beginning, which is uh, my most recent play. And I know uh, Josh and Amy are going to help us read this one. Um, so once again, I'll read the stage directions and I'll just bring it to a stop when we when we get there. So, late autumn 2015, the large living room of a flat in Crouch End, London. It encompasses a lounge area and kitchen. It's a bit of a mess. There's been some sort of party. It's late, the early hours. Standing is Laura, 38. This is her place. She's drinking wine. Looking at her, drinking a bottle of Peroni is Danny, 42. They look at each other for a long time for as long as you think you can get away with. They both jump as a door bangs downstairs. He begins to wander in the room, wander a bit in the room, drinking. He evidently came to the party after work as he's in a shirt and trousers and smart shoes, though his jacket and tie were dispensed some time ago. He has a big ketchup stain on his shirt and is a bit nervous. Laura sits down. Danny doesn't know what to do. So he lights up a cigarette. You didn't fancy it then? Fancy what? Getting in the taxi? No. Why is that then? Don't know. Don't know. Keith called, told me to stay and finish my drink. Keith told you? Well, he said, stay and finish your drink. Right. That's all right? Yeah. Laura smiles and puts down her wine. Nice place. To be honest, I said I'd get it. Get what? The taxi. What? Well, you know. What? I thought he was stopping the night. Right. You see, the trouble with me. What? I've got no radar. No radar? No. Well, it's not that I've not got one at all. Right. It just doesn't pick up a lot. Danny, what the fuck? You know, your radar. I don't know, you, Danny. Your man radar. I'm a woman radar. Oh. <laughs> Curse it sometimes. Two people could literally be clambering. Do people honestly... Like clambering. Do people honestly 
clamber. You know, to get across the room, to get to, to one another. And I wouldn't notice. No. No radar, see? No. No radar. Laura retakes her wine and has a drink. I said, honest, I said, Keith, I'll have the cab back home. You, you bang in there. You bang in there? Yeah. With who? With, with you. I wanted you, Danny. Oh. Like I said, no radar. No, Danny. So I take up internet dating. That plenty of fish, dear me. At least you know where you stand. Hardly, Danny. Have you? At least if you meet a fella at a bar or a party, you can look him in the eye and make a judgment. Well, they have a like you, don't they? He's not my friend, by the way. Who? Keith. No. He's just someone I know. Right. He told you we were friends, right? Yeah, he did. We're not. I've declined friend requests <laughs> on several occasions. Harsh bitch. Laura gives him a look. Like, obviously not harsh bitch, harsh bitch. You think not? Like, obviously you're not. Well, I'm relieved you don't think I'm a harsh bitch. And I'm, I'm not sure you've got my sense of humour. Keith's a bit of an odd one, a cryptic one. A bullshitter. Sometimes I just say to him, spit it out, mate. A blagger. There's no need to be so fucking spooky, is there? Like a monumental and barefaced liar. Laura, I know he's a cunt, but he's my mate. All right. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you. Thanks very much. So... So I think that those three scenes have all got something in common. Uh, what, what might that be? I think as you can tell from quite early on, the reason why it's the play, if that makes sense. Like it's, it feels like it's the most important part of these people's lives at that moment, which is kind of why we're seeing it. Yeah, I think that that's true. I think that that's true. Like what? Like what? What, what happens? I mean, I do think that's true. I think that's an excellent answer. What happens quite quickly in each of these scenes? They like subvert what you like. They subvert what you're expecting. So, like you, like you see a mum and daughter, and then one of them's like taking drugs. It's like oh, instantly, it's like it wrong foots you almost like a, like an audience, I suppose. If that makes sense. Like yeah. It, it totally subverts whatever that thing that you're expecting it to be. It's not. It's going to be something else. Going. So with the knot of the heart, right, which was the first extract we looked at, is Lucy uh, smoking heroin in her mum's garden in front of her mum for the first time ever with her mum's help because her mum doesn't want her to go across the road into Gibson Square, a big thing or a small thing? Massive. It's quite <laughs> massive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so, if you think about in Basildon, right, what, what is it that happens at the beginning of in Basildon? Someone's dying. So someone's at the very end of their life, and then what happens? Well, someone's Family calling. that haven't seen each other or spoken to each other for a really long time mm -hmm. happen to be in the same room. So, the so two sisters have not spoken for 20 years, not mm -hmm. seen each other for a long time. Their brother is on his deathbed. And what does one of the sisters say to the other one? That she wishes. I wish it. I wish it was you that was on your deathbed. Is that a big thing or a small thing? Big thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And just again, and finally, in beginning, you got these two people, Laura and Danny, that are in this situation together. What what happens now in this one? I don't think it happens in the others. It's kind of it's happening on page one, page two. I think in in beginning it's more around kind of page three ish of it, so you've got a little more. The play gives you a little more of a kind of an in of some kind of energy of anticipation here. But what is it? What's the big thing that happens in beginning? It's when Laura says that she wants she her Danny rather than Keith. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is it a big thing or a small thing to have the guts to say to someone, "I wanted you to stay the night," actually? And they're not just big things, they're all, like, they're all firsts. There's all, it's all something completely that's not happened to, to them yeah. before. Yeah, go on, say a bit more about that. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, well, it's the start of the story. It's kind of like when you're talking about quests early on. You, kind of, you yeah. need, for quests to start, you need a, a, some sort of trigger. That, that, that's, that's the start of the drama, that, that mm. moment where mm. you go, it kind of like all these things being, I've not read or seen any of these plays, but I guess they're kind of like, it's almost like the question or the, the kind of the, the conflict and the title of the moment, I guess, is kind of, a, kind of 
makes yeah. Barrier a kind of very big way. Yeah. So in answer to the thing that we were we were talking about earlier, Jane, a bit, is this, I think that what you can do as a writer in kind of the construction of the whole thing, so, so even before you start thinking about writing that scene, in terms of the construction of the whole thing, is you can make a decision as a writer to begin the play with something really fucking big happening. Yeah? Do you know what I mean? Just make a decision as a writer to begin a story, not to tread water as a writer and then begin the story on page 10. Like, I, I always kind of think, so again, like thinking about this toolkit, these things that I have that are trying to keep me, mm. keep me straight as a playwright, to, make, to all these things that are helping me over all these years. Like, something really big, something really big in the first three pages. And if it's on page one, even better. Now, of course, that's not right for every kind of theatre writing, you know? But I suppose for the kind of writing that I'm interested in, I'm really interested in creating a drama where something's at stake, then it's something that really, really helps me. And this is, again, where we, we turn to the kind of final task of this workshop. And again, a really fun one. And we will we just take five minutes over it, right? And in this one, um, I just want you to write the stage direction at the beginning of a play, yeah? So before there's it, even any characters talking to one, one another, and the challenges of the task is to have something really big happen just in the stage direction that kicks off a scene or a play. Does everyone understand what I'm asking you to do? Yeah? Brilliant. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll again take, we'll take five minutes for that task and then we'll come back and share that work and then there'll be an opportunity for our writers uh, in the room or anyone who's watching live uh, via social media if they want to ask any questions of me then we'll do that then. Anyway, we'll see you in about five minutes. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you. Now, Naomi, how did yes. you how did you get on with that one? Do you fancy having a read? I'll have a read. We'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Okay. Um, an empty cafe. Leah, eighteen, enters and looks around, considering where to sit. She chooses a table, and the waitress starts to come over. <laughs> Leah signals to her she's not ready. Self-consciously, she moves to another table. She checks her phone, looks at the menu. Sockney, an older woman, enters the cafe, and Leah looks up. Their eyes meet. The resemblance between them is striking. The end. Fantastic. So what's the big thing in, in that scene, do you think? Yeah, I think we're in the territory of long lost family. Yeah, there, aren't we? Are. A little bit. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. What, what a brilliant opening to a play. Again, I'd like to see that play. Kept me guessing a little bit, that one, because I sort of thought it might be to do with the, the cafe itself, do you know oh, what I mean, or the waitress. So it was great to, again, get the entrance of the other character. Brilliant. Josh, do you fancy having a read of your yeah. one? Um, Linda is banging on her son's door. Linda bangs louder. Linda breaks down the door. Linda enters and finds a handbag on his bed, which is empty. Um, two possible endings here. Either <laughs> Linda sees that his wardrobe is empty, or probably for the stage, Linda opens the wardrobe and finds her son inside. Wow. So either, either I wanted kind of a st start the story, so I thought if his em wardrobe is empty, then at least that's the, her mission is then to go find him. What was in the wardrobe? Well... Scene, yeah, I think there's more drama in it if he's in the wardrobe. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Isn't there? Present drama. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And why, why might why, why might that be my preference? Why might I be saying that? Well, it just poses more for an audience to kind of go, right? Why is he there? What's going on? Why was the door locked? There's yeah. just more questions. Yeah. Again, though, fantastic. I'd like to see that play. Do you mean yeah. like dead in the wardrobe? Oh, Who knows? Okay. I mean, <laughs> he could be hiding, he could be crouching, right, yeah. you know? 
all sorts possibly. of For some reason, I just interpreted that he's dead in the wardrobe. That's where my mind kind of went. Yeah, probably just yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. So, before we sort of like open up into sort of more, any more general questions that you've got, just to sort of to to to, to round off on that exercise as a group, how did you how did you find that? that exercise. I mean, in a way, one of the things it relieves you of is that it kind of relieves you of kind of the setup in a way. Do you know what I mean? The ball yeah, ache of the freeing. setup. It's quite yeah. freeing, that exercise. You just get to use your imagination and just go in somewhere where it's intense. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to worry about, oh, yeah, but how do we get to that point? It doesn't matter. I'm just going to go there. And that's really enjoyable. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Well, something's happening right away, isn't it? Just something's happening right away. I think as well, just from like a, a writerly perspective, you don't feel limited by the stage because sometimes you can, if you overthink it, you just go, oh, well, how will this be done? Will it, is it even possible on stage? And does it need to be TV? Whereas it makes you just go, actually think about what I want to show right now and leave that to someone else to figure out later on. Like it's yeah. more of a, let me create the best opening. Mm. And it's that side that's, I think, I felt really freeing because you just go, oh, great, I can do whatever I want with this now because it's about making sure you start here rather than like here. Yeah. I think as well what it, it also does is it's, is, it's, is, it's, is it's creating a situation at the beginning of a play where you're really sharing a present tense with an audience, aren't mm. you? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You're really sharing a present tense with an audience. And after all, that's, that's what it's all about, right, live performance, which is, is, is an audience and a story in a room together experiencing it together moment by moment and not being in a situation where an audience is in a room with a story that's setting itself up to a beginning do you know what i mean it's it's your 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 begin you, you can know your beginning you really are beginning in a true sense aren't you you know fantastic well thank you so much for all of the enthusiasm and uh, wit and intelligence in your responses to those uh, exercises that I've sort of set up for you there. I mean, you know, these are things that we could spend a whole day on each of them, do you know what I mean, aren't they? But they're, they're just three of the things that I think are most important. And they're also, I really mean this, they're things that I think about all the time. They're not things that I sort of say to other writers that I'm, in, I'm trying to encourage but I don't do myself. These are things that are keeping me honest as a playwright in a way. So I, I, we've got about 10 minutes, I think, left. Um, really, it's kind of over to you a bit. I'm really happy to answer any questions that you've got really about the, you know, uh, the kind of life of a writer or playwriting craft or anything at all, really. Um, so, you know, over to you a bit, basically. Yep. How much planning do you do prior to starting writing something? Does it depend just on what it is, or do you have a way? Do you sit down and do a certain amount of planning before you allow yourself to start writing, or do you just start writing and then sort of plan a bit later? I do do some planning, yeah, before I start, and I do I do a fair amount of planning. So I don't um, I wouldn't work out every beat of a story. But I certainly would know the shape of a play. Mm -hmm. So by that, I would would say things like, you know, with a play like in Basildon, I would know that that was a play that was in four acts, that I had a sense that I wanted to tell that story in four movements for all sorts of reasons to do with the, the meaning of the play. And, um, you know, I kind of wanted to kind of ennoble these working-class, blue-collar-class characters with a Chekhovian form to say that you can, these people deserve a Chekhovian form. They don't just deserve episodic TV. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah? Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of planning that I do. But also I think that there's a, um, there's a kind of planning that's just to do with research. So, so that there are just some things that you can't, I can't write just from my imagination or my experience. So for example, in The Knot of the Heart, where you're in the world of drugs addi addiction and drugs addiction treatment, I needed to talk to lots of people before I could write that play. So there was, for example, a consultant psychiatrist who specialised in addictions called Dr Owen Bowden-Jones, who was wonderful, who really, really helped me, and I literally couldn't have 
written the play without all of the time that I spent with him and the questions that I asked him. So yeah, there are, there's always quite a lot of planning. But you know, um, I also always need to know, although I don't need to know every beat of the story, generally I need to know the end. So I kind of need to know what my finish line is. So in Under the Blue Sky, I knew that the end of the play was two people that were in love on a summer's day where there's not a cloud in the sky. And I kind of didn't know exactly how I was going to get there, but I knew that that was the, the end. So, um, but equally, if I planned out every line of something before I wrote it, that would, that would, um, that would bleed some of the fun. And I would also, I think, be disabling part of what I've got, which is my imagination and creativity. Um, you know, and also I think there's something particularly to writing a play. I remember the actor Ian McDermott saying to me that, that playwriting is writing that goes at the speed of an actor's thought. It's writing that has to exist moment, for moment by moment for an actor and for an audience. And if you think about it, like, the act, you know, I, I sort of feel like in the act of creation of a script, there's something in the discu a sense of discovery moment by moment that's somehow good when you're writing for actors. Mm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, do you ever find that the discoveries moment to moment just take you in a completely different direction? And yeah, of course. Do your yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. You, you, you sort of can find out that you've got a more interesting story to tell than the one you set out to tell, which I think is actually quite a good sign of something worth listening to. You know, don't, don't chuck away good ideas for the pre-planned ideas. Yeah. You know, I think that's, that's absolutely right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you have to get rid of the plan in favour of a new plan all the time, I think, in a way. How does that planning process differ when you're writing something that's going to be like in real time and what kind of challenges of that? Because I read beginning and it is just like, you know, in real time, 90 minutes yeah, as it happens. Yeah, it's a single action wall. Um, I think I think with beginning I had to f I had to fill my way with it a bit more. So that description I was just giving of writing a bit moment to moment, mm. but I I kind of still had a plan. Mm. You know, I still had I still knew the end of the play was that uh, was was they're about to have sex on a sofa. You don't see them have sex. You kind of lights come down as they literally about to get on the sofa so I knew that was the end of the play and I knew that there were all these you know these moments that are important key moments in the story like Laura telling Danny kind of fessing up that she kind of had a bit of an agenda mm. and uh, you know him finding the courage to tell her about his background and things like that and then also moments in the action like them dancing listening to music as a way of getting through the evening because it's all gone a bit peep tong, you know. So, uh, so, so, yeah, there was that kind of, like, um, I felt almost like, the, like they were the tent poles of the play. Mm. But I kind of had to feel my way with that play a lot more because it's all a single action and in real time, as you say, you've just got to stay absolutely truthful to the characters, mm. you know. And, um, and where they are at two in the morning... I mean, it's a really interesting thing. When I wrote Under the Blue Sky, the first act I really plotted out in, in quite rigorous detail, and it worked really well for me. You know, what I was talking about with Nick and Helen and the cooking of the chilli, and that worked really well. And so then when I came to Act 2, I tried to do the same thing with Act 2, mm -hmm. but it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was because the characters were completely pissed. And because the characters were completely pissed, it just didn't feel truthful to organise the writing in, the, in that way. So I had to write that act in a much freer way, you know? Mm. So you have to be true to the characters a bit, I think. Does that answer your question, Naomi? Possibly. Kind of? <laughs> <laughs> OK. Can I ask, yeah. Yeah. early on, yeah. I guess the question's kind of relevant for you, for you now. Like, early on, when you were writing a play, um, just to continue the, the planning, did you, what was your relationship to other plays? Like, did you read other plays whilst writing, um, or go go and watch plays? And 
then if you did, did you allow that? So were they specifically chosen because of what you were writing, and did you allow that to slip in to your work, if that makes sense? Yeah, a little bit, yeah, of course, yeah. So, um, for example, in the first years of there were quite a lot of elegantly structured, r realistic plays that had quite symmetrical sort of structures, like sort of four scenes in Act 1, four scenes in Act 2, with a bit of kind of shape to that. And, um, you know, I think um, Patrick Marber's Closer, which was, I think, on in 97, was quite influential. So I think quite a few of us were kind of writing in that form a bit and looking at each other's work and how, that, how those plays worked. But I think then, you know, as the years have gone by, you're sort of looking at the kind of the tradition you're in and you're also looking for clues as to how to do it. So, so for in Basildon, although I wasn't... You know, I had this idea of ennobling my characters with the four-act form. I didn't really want to write a Chekhovian atmosphere because that wasn't quite right for the play. But I did look at all four of Chekhov's major plays in some detail just to think about how stories told over four acts. And I was particularly interested in the movement of time between act three and four. So sometimes in those big Chekhov, those major Chekhovs, there's a bit of a gap. I think it's only in Three Sisters, isn't it, that there's a less of a less of a gap between Acts three and four. So, so it really helped me, you know. It really, really, um, it really, it really helped me that, um, yeah. And and when I wrote Under the Blue Sky, that's a play that's kind of like a theatrical triptych, like uh, this idea in visual art of three panels with a kind of a narrative or a link linked by theme, if not by narrative. And so, um, so I, I kind of knew that there were two other plays that were kind of theatrical triptychs. There's Wallace, Wallace Shawn's play, A Thought in Three Parts, and Robert Hulman's play, Making Noise Quietly. So I just had a look at them, you know, and sort of tried to figure out a bit how they worked and what could help me in some way. I mean, I think, you know, someone mentioned earlier this thing of confidence. And I think sometimes what... When you look at the plays that you're standing in the line with, e even if they don't always give you like some practical clues as to how you're going to crack the problems in your drama, what they can give you is a bit of confidence. So in Under the Blue Sky, I was like, well, these playwrights have written in this kind of triptych form. I'm going to have a go. Do you know what I mean? So I think confidence is always a big thing, isn't it? Yeah, I do look at other people's work. I mean, if you come into my office, I mean, I'm a geek. I mean, I've got, like, I've probably got... I probably own something like six or seven hundred plays. Yeah, I've got quite a big play collection now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous, really, but it's true. <laughs> Massively, massively, yeah. So, so firstly, like, um, it is different because it's not come out of my body. You know, writing is a physical act. It's something that, it's not just a thing of the mind. It's, it's, it's something that's coming out of your body, you know. It's coming out of a whole you, uh, the act of writing. And so working on something that doesn't start with you in that way... Um, it's a kind of getting to know you process, I think, and getting to know it intimately until it feels a part of you, is how I feel about it. So, like, I often like don't want to presume to have the author's authority in rehearsals of an adaptation or a version, because I think, well, that would make me a bit of a fraud, because I'm not Ibsen, you know, I'm Ibsen's adapter. And so, you know, in the room, I definitely would pose myself as Ibsen's defender. Do you know what I mean, in the room? But I do, by that stage, feel as emotionally involved as if it was an original plan of mine. And I think that's absolutely correct as well. I don't think I should ever be adapting anything that I didn't care as much by the end as I did an original plan. And then the second part of your question, I have learned so much from... 
working on other writers' material. And I think that if you look at my plays, actually, that there's a kind of before adaptation, so before Feston and Ibsen, the, the plays are quite characterful and character-led. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And then you see the plotting and the story elements of my plays getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And this is partly just because, you know, these, these Ibsens, they're like great oak trees. They're made of, so you know, they're, they're made of, they're so solid. You know, they've got these great kind of stories, these big muscular stories. I mean, the director and playwright Peter Gill sort of said, well, you know, if Ibsen was writing, you know, 50 years later, he would have been doing these big MGM Hollywood films. Do you know what I mean? These great muscular things. And so they're, they're really valuable. And I've learned so much from the work I've done on those stories and uh, I'm really grateful for it because you know I think if you're open to it you learn you learn so much um, I mean you know for example in doing John Gabriel Borkman I sort of became aware as I worked on it how each act it was a really really was a modernist piece of work in the sense that each act was written in a different style and I realised that previous translations I've read have tended to flatten him out a bit and make the tone the same. But actually in act one, it's like a sticker mythic fist fight between these sisters. This big row between these sisters, essentially, you know, almost like Top Girls, the end of Top Girls. And then act two, it's like the dance macabre is going, it's like opera, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's so kind of melodramatic and all of that. Act three, suddenly, when Fanny Wilton turns up, it's sitcom, and Ibsen's writing the space for the laughter and then shutting down the laughter. And then, by the end, we're on the mountain, and it's like Beckett, and Borkman's dying on the mountain, and it was incredible to, to, to work on something like that, because you learn so much. Anyway, they're, they're really inspiring, so I would in, encourage any, any writer to, to, you know, if you have the opportunity to, to work on great material like that, because you do get so much, so much from it. I'm really sorry to say we're just after eight o'clock now, so um, so we probably need to draw to a close now. But thank you very much for your participation. You've been a fantastic group. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for your enthusiastic and witty responses to the um, exercises, and for thanks to everyone who's watching wherever you are uh, on your uh, iPhones or iPads or computers or whatever medium you're tuning in on. Um, I should just say though, uh, this workshop will be available on the writerplay.co.uk website shortly uh, and there'll be captioning. Uh, please do join us again at 6pm on the 7th of March uh, for a workshop with the playwright Joe Cliff Clifford on epic narratives and being political in your work. So once again, thanks very much, everyone, uh, and good night. Good luck writing your plays. <laughs> <laughs>